Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy today. And today our topic matter of discussion is hemorrhoids. And you know, I usually pick a topic in which I've had customers or people come in throughout the last couple of weeks since our last show. Uh, and this seems to be a subject that seems to be a problem. Actually, based upon the statistics I discovered, a very common problem. Over two thirds of our population have suffered from hemorrhoids sometime in their life, and one third of our population suffers an ongoing problem with hemorrhoids. And what it basically is, it's an inflammation and swelling of the veins of the anus and rectum. And it can be either internal, slightly external, where if you go to the restroom, you'll get a, it'll come out, especially if you're pushing. Or it can be a prolapse where it does not go back in again and it uh, stays extended. Now, generally when they're internal, you won't see it so much, you won't notice it so much, there's not much pain associated. You may notice it on a colonoscopy or the doctor might. But when it starts to start be external or prolapsed, um, that's when you're gonna have pain, itching, and then when it's prolapsed, I mean a lot of bleeding uh, and oftentimes can require surgical intervention at that point. Now to get to that point, um, it takes a lot, but I've seen it in uh, kids as young as 10 years old and then all the way up to seniors. Now when we look at uh, what the symptoms are, now this is a wide range of variety depending on what stage of uh, the hemorrhoid vein uh, inflammatory response is occurring. So initially you'll get a little bit of itching, maybe a little bit of bleeding, burning, and, and mild kinds of pain symptoms. Especially when you try to use the restroom and you're constipated, you'll get that pain and bleeding. Now eventually you'll see a blue or purple patches of a hard skin area near the anus and a gastroenterologist or someone who does your, uh, if you're a guy, to, uh, checks for the prostate will notice this discoloration around the anal rectum area. Eventually, if it becomes extreme, you literally get a lumpy type of tissue protu uh, protruding from the anus. And it's vis visually, uh, you can see it from the exterior as well as the uh, patient can feel it as well too. Very painful. It's like having a vein on the outside <laughs> of your body exposed to all the in environmental issues and um, not fun. And that's why so many times they'll do surgical intervention when it reaches that point. Now root causes are many. The biggest problem seems to be mostly constipation. And when we look at the issues of constipation, it's a lack of fiber, the lack of good fats in the diet, uh, dehydration, jeez, uh, all the gooey clumpy bread you can smush into a ball. Uh, you know, soda is a huge one because it depletes certain minerals. A lot of coffee can cause dehydration or the wonderful monster drinks causing dehydration. So you lose your minerals. Uh, the lack of B6 and the lack of magnesium is a huge one. Among pregnancy or women that are pregnant or have just had a child, you know, the pushing out when you have uh, childbirth or the constant pressure that uh, being pregnant uh, affords uh, we see this quite common in women when they're pregnant. Um, other contributing factors can be candida or chronic parasitical infections. And then of course, anytime you had food allergies or uh, foods that you have sensitivities to like a, uh, any kind of food allergies or gluten intolerances, that can contribute to that chronic inflammatory response down in the anal or rectal area, lending itself to hemorrhoids as well too. Um, I, I particularly notice it's mostly diet when people come in and talk to me. I know we can look at all these other issues that intertwine, but if the diet and proper supplementation is in order, very rarely do I see it not uh, heal itself or go away in the early stages. Now once it's protruding, the best we can do uh, is usually surgical intervention and hopefully reduction of inflammatory um, through diet changes. So I'm going to move on to the diet section because I think this is probably one of the most important factors when you're talking about it. You've got to have a diet rich in fiber, at least 35 grams of soluble and insoluble fiber. And that's anywhere from 8 to 12 servings of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains per day. 
that's very difficult to get. I know I get smoothies, and so that's very helpful, and, and salads and um, your things like Ezekiel bread. Those fi that fiber is very, very um, important. I mean, you can add a supplementation of psyllium husk fiber or flaxseed meal, which can uh, increase the amounts of fiber that you're in ingesting, because that fiber is what helps move things out and move it along so it doesn't get sticky and gummified uh, in the bowel. Eating um, foods that are rich in good fats, including nuts, seeds, flaxseed meal, flaxseed oil, any of those good fats. I know the government tells us we need a minimum of 20 grams of fat per day, but I think it's more like 40 grams of good fats. So once again, we're not talking about meat-based meat types of fats, cheeses which are constipating, uh, most dairy is fairly constipating. We're talking about doing good plant-based fats in your nuts, seeds, um, and types of meal. Eating leafy greens. Now a lot of our population is vitamin K deficient. Now when you're K deficient, your vascular system becomes very, very, very fragile and you'll get that bleeding and that can be a, contribute, a contributing factor to all vascular health issues. Now remember, this is an inflamed vein uh, in the uh, rectal area, so any way we can reduce the circulatory inflammation is very important in the venous system. Avoiding caffeine and alcohol, which are very, very dehydrating. Now, when you wash away your minerals and you wash away your water, nothing's going to move in the digestive tract and you're going to get constipated. So, obviously, I tell my customers, if you're going to have a cup of coffee, then you better be doing a cup of coconut water or some source of counteracting uh, potassium-rich foods that don't wash away your electrolytes. You gotta avoid sugar and spicy foods. Obviously, jalapenos are out of the question. But anything that's really spicy, uh, which can be most of your cayennes, um, and I'm not including garlic in this, but cayenne, um, pepper-based types of products, and nightshades. So remember, most of the time when we're eating peppers, we're eating some source of tomato that goes along with it. The nightshade classification of vegetables um, don't produce a glucoalkaloid that doesn't allow the body to get rid of inflammation. And 68% of Americans, according to Rutgers University studies, are nightshade sensitive. So tomatoes, potatoes, peppers, eggplant, tomatillos, that classification of vegetables should be avoided by anybody who has any, any inflammatory problems including hemorrhoids. You've got to avoid foods that trigger allergies. Now we're seeing more and more of gluten intolerance or gluten sensitivities arising since it's been such a poor quality of wheat and breads and cereal products that have been, been eaten throughout the last probably 30, 40 years. It's gone to the smushy breads, the you, know, you look at the cereals and, you, and, and this confuses me because I look at a cereals like you know, uh, other than oatmeal, but like Cheerios and things like that. But they're actually very processed types of cereals, and they're not rich in fiber. They're not whole foods. They're compressed flour that's ground up, and they say, here, eat this. Um, we're talking about whole grains, which would be more like your oat brands, uh, your rice brands, those types of cereals that are going to be whole grained. Even shredded wheat is better than, uh, than the processed cereals. Um, supplementation is interesting. Now, mind you, notwithstanding all the diet, uh, you know, getting enough water, adequate amounts of good fiber, adequate amounts of good fats in the diet, um, adequate some amounts of K-producing greens, and that means at least two servings of, of greens per day to get adequate amount of K. The digestive tract will take those greens and it will help you manufacture with the, um, their fermentation and bacteria process, the vitamin K necessary to support vascular health. Otherwise, supplementation with vitamin K and K2 is, uh, is required. Now, I, I, what I did, there's a lengthy list of supplements, but these are, I prioritized the ones that I thought that were most important and that we probably saw the fastest results with that had the most studies. Number one, flaxseed oil or flaxseed meal. What I'm trying to get here is at least 10 to 20 grams of some source of good fats, and flaxseed reduces inflammation phenomenally, whether it's in the bowel 
uh, the liver or the kidneys. It's a wonder an, an, wonderful anti-inflammatory and it helps prevent or limit constipation as well too. Um, magnesium citrate. Now magnesium is required to increase peristalsis in the bowel and that's that wave-like motion that helps move along the bowel and soften the tissues. And remember if you're doing high caffeine, high sugar, a lousy diet, it's washing out your magnesium potassium based minerals. So supplementing with magnesium generally relaxes uh, the bowel and it actually helps soften the stool as well too. One of the key ways to help prevent constipation and, and there in turn prevent uh, hemorrhoids. Now there are some herbs that are very supportive of the vascular health of the, uh, uh, of the venous system in the lower extremities. There's two in particular. Uh, horse chestnut extract, uh, 100 micrograms of extract twice a day, and it actually constricts the vascular system and reduces the inflammation down so you don't have so much swelling. Butcher's broom extract does the same, and I have to say you can usually get these in combinations or take them individually, but we see them a lot too in varicose vein support as well because it does reduce vascular in inflammatory response. Ester C and bioflavonoids. Now this had clinical studies as well, 1,000 milligrams of ye each. Now that's a mineral ascorbate C in combination with 1,000 milligrams of bioflavonoids supports capillary health and that can help reduce the inflammation but it can also strengthen the vascular system and prevent some of that chronic bleeding and inflammatory response. Um, not just for hemorrhoids but in the overall health of your entire, entire venous system. Um, witch hazel. Now, um, you know, after we have babies, we notice oftentimes when we have episiotomies is they'll give us these little pads that have witch hazel on. You can literally grab or buy any good health food store witch hazel, put it on uh, just a nice little cotton pad and stuff it right in the anal area and that can really help reduce uh, the inflammatory response very soothing, very cooling, and you can combine that with a little bit of aloe vera as well too, which can reduce some of that burning that you get with hemorrhoids as well too. Um, bilberry. Now I know we usually think, when we think of bilberry, we think about our eyes, because bilberry really does can, and can help with night vision and the small capillaries in your eyes. Um, I know since I started adding bilberry and grapeseed uh, extract, I watched my eye pressure reduce just in one year 15%. So very, very helpful for the small capillaries. But also, in turn, it showed among pregnant women a reduction, uh, especially with all the pressure being issued, of hemorrhoids uh, and constipation as well, too. Now, superfood greens. We talk a lot about this, and this goes back to diet. Once again, when your diet is acidic, it has a lot of sugar, white flour, pasta, starches, a lot of junk, what happens then is the body becomes very acidic. Now when you be become acidic, you become very, very inflamed. What I suggest to people is a wonderful, nice little super green drink, and I love making this in the little Nutribullet, or if you've got a Vitamix, Vitamix, I love this for reducing the inflammation. And all you do is you take a handful of kale, a handful of spinach, maybe a little bit of strawberries. You can use a half a banana. We gotta watch bananas, but they're very rich in potassium. Uh, a little bit of honey or agave to sweeten it. And uh, you, little unsweetened almond milk, because once again, we're trying to keep the sugars down. And a scoop of a nice either vegetarian or a very clean protein. And a third or a quarter uh, cup of avocado, or a third or a quarter uh, of an avocado. Blend that up real, real nice and smooth. You're gonna get fiber, you're gonna get your superfood greens, you're gonna increase magnesium, you're gonna increase potassium, and you're gonna increase your good fats uh, in your diet. We call it the green goddess at our, at our store, but green goddess with protein. But that's very helpful, those super greens, at reducing the inflammatory response. And I have more of my customers that have lower leg extremity issues or that come in with hemorrhoids and they'll ask me, all right, what can I do or what can I drink? And I send it back and I get a green goddess and then I refer them to some of those supplements as well too. 
Um, I hope that helps. Um, once again, venous problems are very common. You must also in turn keep a good multiple high in Bs, keep your vitamin C levels up, vitamin K, and dietary changes as we've discussed. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you very much. In an article, a research article titled, Reversing Walking Corpse Syndrome, otherwise known as Cotard Syndrome, they found the trigger, and it is in a common cold sore cream, one normally known as the cyclovir. And it affects those people with compromised kidney conditions especially bad. What is Cotard Syndrome? Well, let's just read the quote. A condition causing people to feel as if they have died, or parts of the body are dead or no longer exist. Yep, what you with Modern pharmacology, people in the grips of Cotard's delusion can also believe they have lost their blood and internal organs, such as their brain, and cannot respond to any rational reasoning with them that they are in fact alive. Yes, this does happen. A cyclovir, also known as Zovarax, is a drug commonly used to treat cold sores in the herpes virus as well as chicken pox and shingles. So now as you go run to your medicine cabinet to see if it's something that you're actually taking or not, let's just keep on going. Not everybody will experience that walking dead syndrome. Just 1% of you on any given day will have experienced that. So one in a hundred chance every time you apply that cream, that's you. All right, after that, this study was published in the Journal of Neurological Sciences, not some black magic um, voodoo doll book. The link was made after a woman suffering from shingles began showing symptoms of Cotard delusions, thought she was dead, after using cyclovir as a treatment, the new scientists have reported. And basically, the woman ran into the hospital in an extremely anxious state, the authors state, and this is a hospital in Stockholm. After receiving dialysis, the woman explained that she had felt anxious because she had been overwhelmed by a strong feeling that she was dead. Within a few hours, her symptoms began to ease until she felt she was pretty sure she wasn't dead. That's what they said. Blood analysis later revealed that a cyclovir, which can normally be broken down in the body before being flushed out of the kidneys, can now leave low levels of a breakdown product called CMMG. Now, what CMMG does in the body is one interesting thing. It can cause your blood pressure to skyrocket. So that could be a side effect also of the cyclovir. But the reason they believe it causes you to think that you are dead or on the verge of being dead, we're not having a brain, blood, or internal organs, henceforth Cotard syndrome, we basically is that it causes constriction of the arteries in the brain. So the next time you go to apply that cold sore cream, think about that. It's basically cutting off the blood flow to your head. Some people more than others, <laughs> but just to keep in mind, walking dead syndrome, Cotard's, Again, from a textbook case of making your own zombie. And now, another thing to protect you from radiation. After all the things which are coming out that protect you from radiation, like beta-glucan, resveratrol, corella, etc., etc., there should be real no reason soon to be a victim of it. Now, what do I have next? It's derived from cabbage, broccoli, and other cruciferous vegetables, and it's often used as breast cancer, prostate cancer treatment, and so on and so forth. Diendimethylene, otherwise known as DIM. Now, this was pro produced in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and all it used was the DIM. They didn't mix it with the anti-radiation drug itself. What they found is this. DIM has been studied as a cancer prevention agent for years, which many of us that follow health know. But this is the first indication that DIM can actually act as a radiation protector. For the study, they gave it, now keep this in mind, they gave it after the exposure. So it's probably not a bad idea, something to keep on hand. But they did do injection to assure proper absorption. So keep that in mind. DIM has been studied as a cancer prevention, da 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 da. For the study, the researchers irradiated rats with lethal doses of gamma radiation. The animals were then treated with a daily injection of DIM for two weeks, 14 days, starting about 10 minutes after the radiation exposure. Again, DIM, dimethylene, extracted from cruciferous vegetables. 
All of the untreated rats died, but over half the dianemethylene treated animals lived past 30 days at least, or survived at lethal exposure to radiation. 50% may not sound like a great figure to a lot of you, but 50% over 0% is pretty significant. What they also said too, in addition, the irradiated mice treated with the DIM had less of a reduction in red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. So the radiation didn't have as much impact under the production of the DIM, even taken post exposure. They said too, the researchers from the Journal of um, from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences said, DIM could protect normal tissues in patients receiving radiation therapy for cancer. And they said just protect the normal cells, but also protect individuals from lethal consequences of a nuclear disaster, i.e. Fukushima and all those downstream from it. Something to keep in mind, reality, there's no reason necessarily to be totally a victim of radiation exposure these days. There's lots of good studies on things that can help. Again, beta-glucan, resveratrol, corella, now dim. You've got an arsenal in your cabinet, so take some control. And after that, for our video gamers. Now this may not seem important in regards to health, but it will be. And it's becoming uh, more and more common. Now what does video games have to do with health? Well, this produced in the Psychonomic Bulletin, Psychonomic, sorry, Bulletin and Review, a research article called Virtually Numbed. Immersive video game alters real life experience. Now we're not talking delusions of grandeur or anybody thinking they're at work and they're gonna be running in the middle of the street. What we are talking about is actually being able to feel, period. And again, now we're talking not emotions and touchy-feely stuff either. We're just talking literally how to feel. And this is what they discovered. Spending time immersed as a virtual character or avatar in a role-playing video game can numb you to, to realizing important body signals in real life. This message comes from the Weidenberg uh, Herdick in Germany, the university, and Stephen Lohan, Melbourne University in Australia. The researchers studied what happens when gamers take on the role and identity of a non-human character, such as an avatar during immersive video gaming, and how it especially influences their experience of pain. Avatars often have automaton-like robotic characteristics, for those that don't play video games, such as mechanics inertness, rigidity, and lack of emotion and warmth. Are they all right? Participants were asked how much time they spend each week playing video games. The responses were then correlated with a measure of pain tolerance by counting the number of paper clips they could retrieve from ice cold water. In a second experiment, participants played either immersive or non-immersive computer game before taking part in the same pain resistant task. The immersive video game players, many taken on the role of an avatar or basically an automaton or whatever you want to call it, exhibited reduced sensitivity to pain and removed significantly more paper clips from the ice water. They were, more so, they were also more indifferent to people depicted as experiencing displeasure mm -hmm. than were the non-immersive players in regards to pain and things like that. What is interesting is this, and this was a concern. Now one thing immersive video game play may not be a bad idea to those that are in chronic pain and things along those lines, because it does tend to disassociate. But the interesting fact that these uh, gentlemen came up with was basically as we are tempted to make computers and machines more like humans, we ironically are becoming more like machines. And so it's an interesting trade-off. We're actually beginning to disassociate ourselves from a lot of what makes us human as we're trying to make our toasters, computers, and our refrigerators more like human per se. And they said too, we should look also look at how we can make best of the use of these beneficial applications of robotic or artificial intelligence advances so as to be able to use our freed up resources and individual potentials wisely rather than becoming enslaved by those advances. Interesting as far as creating that disassociation. Kind of runs along for the catards in the herpes virus and the cyclovir, but without the pharmacology aspect. <laughs> and now also, come in down to exercise, which will not happen in a lot of video game players. Uh, there's many exceptions, but still. 
Moderate exercise not only treats, but prevents depression. And this is an interesting aspect when you look at the burden of healthcare cost. This is what they're looking at, is the fact is healthcare does not have to be expensive if you actually get up and do something about it. And now in their case, this was, this was printed in the October issue of the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, which you think about it is so much more effective than just plain medicine, preventative medicine. What they did is this was the first longitudinal review to focus exclusively on the role of exercise plays in maintaining good mental health and preventing the onset of depression later in life. What Guy Faulkner, yeah, that's his actual name, not to be confused with V from Vendetta, uh, co-author co and review analyzed over 26 years worth of research findings to discover that even low levels of physical activity, talking walking and gardening for 20 to 30 minutes a day, we're talking barely anything, just something, can ward off depression in people of all ages. Not make you feel better, just making sure you never fall into the pit of depression itself. Mamming's findings, Guy Faulkner's partner, come to a time when mental health experts want to expand their approach beyond treating depression with costly prescription medication. We need a prevention strategy now more than ever, they say. It says our health system is taxed. We need to shift focus away from shift focus and look for ways to fend off depression from the start. It's definitely worth taking note that if you are currently active, you should sustain it. If you are not physically active, you should initiate the habit. Come on, we're talking walking or gardening for 20 or 30 minutes a day, or at least walk a mall and go shopping. It says the review shows promising evidence that the impact of being active goes well far beyond the physical. And that's it. My time is up. And thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Ralph. We appreciate it. Once again, do your research. And then we're going to expound upon the radiation uh, subject and give you some suggestions on how you can protect yourself against radiation uh, exposure and the damage caused thereof. Thank you for joining our show.